One of the biggest challenges for people is everybody wants a better quality of life. Everybody wants life to be greater, but almost all of us get stuck at times where something stops us, something prevents us from doing something that we really are capable of doing. Whether it's turning around our body or shifting a relationship or turning around our finances or just maybe just being happy and fulfilled at a different level, we get stuck with a belief of how we're not supposed to be, what we're not supposed to do, what people won't accept, what we're not capable of. Or maybe we get stuck in an emotional pattern of just being pissed off or frustrated or worried or sad or overwhelmed. Sometimes we get stuck, you know, not so much in anything but some just some habits of doing things a certain way. And what a breakthrough simply is, is that moment in time where there's an opening. And the opening can come from a conversation, it can come from meeting somebody that inspires you, it can come from an insight, it can come from watching a movie and being moved emotionally at just that right moment. It usually comes because something kind of clicked inside of us. Something snapped us and made us look at life through a different filter, in a different way. And you know it's a real breakthrough because you take that little insight, that little distinction, that little moment, or maybe that little or big emotion inside of you that says, no more, I'm gonna change this, and suddenly you do something to make your life better. You break out of the impossibility of life has to be this way, or life is controlling me, and you start to take back control of your life. You start to make the shift that creates the quality of life that you really deserve. Everybody experiences extreme stress at some point in their life. I don't care who we are. Something happens outside our control and it hits our life and it knocks us on our tail. It might be a health stress. It could be something with your family. It could be economic, career. It could be something emotional that happens, biochemical. There's so many things. It could be an environmental situation that had nothing to do with you. Every one of us in our lifetime are experiencing extreme stress in these days because of the economy and the way we respond to it. The majority of people are experiencing some form of extreme stress, at least according to polls. Stress doesn't come from the facts. Stress comes from the meaning that we give the facts. Yes, those things have happened. But the real question is, if we fight what's happened, we've got a problem. We've got to decide, what are we going to do with what's happened in our life? How are we going to take this? How are we going to mold this? How are we going to turn our life around? Because when you come up with a new meaning, you get a new life. And we're going to take a look at something from a different perspective. We're going to ask you this question. What is the single force that controls the quality of your life? If there was one gift our Creator has given us, or the universe, whatever you believe, what is it, what is the one power that you have right now in this moment that can change everything? You have it, I have it, we all have it. This one singular individual power that can change anything in our life, regardless of what's happened to us. And I know you know the answer. The answer is the power of choice. The one thing we have in this world is we can't control the events, but we can choose what to focus on, we can choose what things mean, and we can choose what to do. Those three choices, those three decisions, really control our life. It's not so much the conditions of our life that control our destiny as much as the decisions of our life. Try for a second to think about something. Think about your life and just think about, are there a few decisions? If I were to ask you two decisions you've made in your life, you know, that if you would have made a different decision, you would have had a totally different life. I mean, it may be, a life may have been better, it may have been worse, I don't know, but you would have a different life. I'm not asking you to, to buy into the fact that you should have known the answers, I just want you to see the power of a decision. How is your life better today because of a decision you made years ago? Not just negative ones. Think about it, sometimes a little decision changes your whole life. Like you decide one day to go to a certain school, and you go to that school or you, to go eat someplace and you bump into the person that becomes the love of your life. Or you meet someone and you decide as a result of that that you're gonna become a photographer or a software engineer or a business person or a doctor, a dentist, whatever. They impacted you but you made the decision, that's what I really want, that's what, that's what my life's gonna be about. And that decision has affected so much of your life, what you do, how you live your life, how you spend your time, what you earn or don't earn, you know, who you attract into your life, beliefs you have, all come from some of these little decisions. What you decide to eat from your dinner plate each night certainly determines your physical destiny, right? We all know that, at least to a certain extent. I know there's a certain amount that's genetics, but I'm talking about the stuff you and I can control. So decisions equal destiny. 
It's not our conditions, it's our decisions. So if we want a new life, if we want a new experience, we've got to make new choices. If you don't like the way your career is or your business is, change it. If you don't like your body, change it. If you don't like your relationship, change you first. Because if you change it, you'll bring you to the next one. Maybe it's time to change it too, but change yourself first. If you want to change anything in your life, you have the choice. So there is no right or wrong. I just want to make you aware in this breakthrough session that everything in our life changes the moment we make a decision. And I mean a real decision. A decision is when you cut off any other possibility and you commit to something with everything you've got and you take action. But the big decisions start with little decisions like what am I going to focus on? Because whatever you focus on, you're going to feel. If you focus on all the things that have been done to you in your life, of course you're going to feel like hell. If you focus on all the amazing coincidences that have happened, things that Maybe they were guided, maybe not, but things happen. And because of that, you met this person that's your best friend, your husband, your wife. Or because of that, you have this ability. Or because you were there that day, God, you missed an accident. I don't know what it is, but whatever you focus on, you're going to feel. If you focus on people don't care, and you'll look for reasons why they don't care, and evidence they don't care, you'll find it everywhere. If you look for evidence that people are really good people inside, that at some level we all care about each other, you'll find it. Seek and you shall find. The secret is, have you become conscious about your decision making? Because this breakthrough session is really you want to change your life, make new choices. New life comes from new choices, but you got to make conscious choices. When you make decisions about what to focus on and what things mean and what to do and you're unconscious, you get pretty terrible results usually. Now we've all done this, I do it still, we all do, but if you want to change your results, you've got to become more conscious in your decision making. So think about it. What you focus on, you will feel. Whether it's true or not, you focus on how people don't care, you're going to feel they don't care. Second decision you make is what do things mean? So you focus on something someone does and you come up with a meaning and the meaning is no one loves me. The meaning is they're trying to take advantage of me. Depending on what meaning you come up with, and you get to choose the meaning of anything. For some people, they say, this situation happened with the economy, and what that means is I'm going broke. Somebody else said, the situation happened with the economy, guess what? That means I'm going to work harder, I'm going to be more creative, it changed everything. Everybody else is going to quit, so we're going to dominate the marketplace. <laughs> Are people to do it? Is this the end right now, or is it the beginning? See, whether it's the end or beginning is your choice. You get to decide. Because once you make up a meaning, it's true. If you think that this is the end of a relationship, are you going to treat people the same way as if you think it's the beginning of a relationship? No way. In fact, I tell people, if you want to have a great relationship, think about this. Treat people like you did in the beginning of the relationship, and there won't be an end. In the beginning of the relationship, when somebody says to you, would you take out the trash, what do you say? Of course, take out the trash. And <laughs> you're happy to do anything, right? But after about six months or six years, you go take them out the trash. You go, what do you mean? Well, I look like your janitor. Take out your own trash. The meaning we give things is very different. And so we feel different and our life is different. In the beginning, you'll do anything for someone. Now you make up a new meaning. Why should I have to do that for them? Little choices, like what to believe about yourself, what to believe about other people, whether this is the end or the beginning, start to affect your whole life. And the third decision we make, we decide what to focus on, most of us unconsciously. We decide what things mean, and the third thing we decide is, what are we going to do? We decide to quit because it's overwhelming. We decide to get strong and focus. We decide we're going to turn it around. We decide to wait and see. Ultimately, your destiny is determined by what you do. So, for example, what do you do if somebody comes to you one day and says, you have a tumor? Again, I had that experience. I use that as a reference point because had a lot of intense experiences in my life, but that was one of the more intense ones for sure. Had many, but that was very intense. You know, first, what do you focus on? Do you focus on it's over? Do you focus on why me? Do you give it a meaning that says, I'm gonna die? What do you do? Do you just go through traditional therapeutic approach? Do you put yourself in the hands of someone else? Do you evaluate this? You get a second or third opinion your destiny is determined by your decisions
Now, if you're a guy like Lance Armstrong, you focus immediately on, I gotta find a solution. The meaning you come up with is, this is the ultimate battle. And what you decide to do is you're gonna exhaust every possibility. Now, that doesn't guarantee you're gonna succeed, but it's interesting. When you have that kind of a mindset, it shifts you. And Lance Armstrong, I mean, he was told things like, look, you got, a, you got tumors here in your brain, you got them in your lungs, right? You got, obviously, in testicles, and you ride a bike for a living. That's pretty tough. But he made it to all of those pieces. Now, am I saying because he made the right choices? I can't tell you that. There's certainly some grace in everything. I think in life, there's three things. There's our ability to choose what we're focused on, or to commit, to get a result, to put all our intention and focus into something. There's our ability to do the right things, to have the right strategy, to execute. And then there's some grace. There's what some people call luck, some people call grace. There's if you do the right things over and over again and with total focus, Sometimes, you know, you get good fortune that comes your way. And you tend to have more good fortune when you're totally focused and decisive and you take lots of action than if you kind of just sit around and accept things like, like you don't have a future. But the point of the matter is, this guy turned it around. What was he like after he got through this problem? After he had his breakthrough, after he faced cancer, racing against some other guy seemed like nothing by comparison. You're not much of a competitor. I faced death. And he goes on to win Tour de France after Tour de France after Tour de France, breaking every record anyone could ever imagine. What do you do Mac, decades ago, half a century ago almost now, and someone says to you, go to the back of the bus, and you're African American. One woman just decided, you know what, you can't take my dignity from me. I can only give that up, and I don't choose to give it up, and I will not go back to the bus. The answer is no. And Rosa Parks changed an entire society. Because that day she chose to focus on something else. She gave it a different meaning. This is not a command. You do not have control over me. And she decided to fight. And she changed the direction of a country and of many other countries. She started something. We forget that you don't have to be famous to have the ability to change at least your own personal history. To change the direction we go in our life. We have the power to choose even if you haven't before. You can finally say no more. I won't put up with that within myself or from anybody else. And here's what I'm gonna do differently. That's where the breakthroughs really start to happen. Now the question is, why do some people stand their ground and make something change versus other people just kind of accept things? Why do some people make bold decisions and other people make decisions that are based on trying to hang on to what they've got? Because when you can change your decisions, you can change your life. When you can change the force that controls your decisions, you can change anything in your life. At some level, we have certain beliefs and values. But if I was going to make it simple, I'd say there's two things that determine your choices. The first thing is the state of mind and emotion you're in at that moment. Think about it. Have you ever snapped at somebody and had nothing to do with them? It was just the state you're in, right? You're frustrated, you're pissed off about something, and in that state of mind, Whatever they said got interpreted through that state and you made up a meaning like they were an irritant or they were interrupting you, they weren't. You probably felt bad afterwards. When we get in the wrong state, we make the wrong decisions. When you get in a strong, empowering state, you'll make a better decision. Learning how to direct your state is a big part of what my work is with people and it's a big part of what I do in my seminars. But the other thing that affects your decisions would be what I would call your story or your blueprint. We all have kind of a story about how our life is supposed to be. It comes from a set of life experiences, interpretations. Some people think life is all about getting theirs. Some people think life is about growing and contributing. Some people think life is about making judgments. Some people think life is about saving other people's lives. Some people think life is about being successful. Some people think God is the basis of everything and the way to know God is to go through life in a very specific way with a set of rules and they follow it. And that's what they believe. Whatever your story is, whatever your blueprint, your blueprint is just another way of saying, whatever you believe is how your life is supposed to be, at some level, we either follow that blueprint or we fight it. If we follow it or we fight it, we're gonna find that we're gonna bump into things in life where life isn't always the same as we expect it to be or think it should be. And that's where we start to experience stress.
I really believe life is the dance between what you desire most and fear most. That's where you find where we live our life. The dance between what you want most and what you fear most. That's, that's where all that energy is in life. So, what does she want? She wants to be famous. She wants to be able to sing and have everyone hear her voice and be able to touch everyone. She wants to contribute. She wants to share her gift. And she definitely wants to be famous and successful. She needs to be closer to her children. And one of the big challenges in life is oftentimes what we want and what we need are two different things. She has five boys. They're all extremely young, as I'm sure you saw. And she has a husband. And while they're all supportive of her going on this journey, somewhere along the line, she lost that connection to what was most important. Now, is she a bad person to make bad decisions? No, good people make bad decisions when they get in lousy states, when our ego gets involved, or when we start believing our story. And here was the story she had. Being a mom's important, but the bigger gift God gave me is my singing voice. And once we get seduced into a particular story and we start to believe it, it takes a hold of our life and it controls all of our choices. And then pretty soon, bad choice on top of bad choice on top of bad choice starts to affect our life. Can you relate? How many times you've made some choices that you wish like hell you would have made a different decision back then and, and or that no one ever knows the stupid decisions you've made? I know I can relate to that. So what I want to talk to you about today for this brief little session is how to break through a crisis. Crises happen, whatever type of crises you go through in your life, and I know you've had many, when we make some co choices unconsciously and we get consequences. And we make them unconsciously because we're trying to get what we want, we don't really know what we value most, we don't know what we need, and we find ourselves waking up one day and going, why is my life this way? It's kind of like life is always calling to us to constantly grow and improve. You know, if you're going to look at what's going to make life work, it's really simple. What makes people happy is progress. We're happy when we're progressing. If you're overweight, but you leave today and you say, you know what, this breakthrough thing, what I got out of today for me more than anything else is, I've been stuck waiting for some magical diet, some magical exercise plan, some magical time in the future when we have more time. There is more, no more time. I don't need to wait for that. I'm just gonna make a decision today to get started. I don't need to go out there and, and go interview 20 trainers and get online. I don't need somebody to give me a perfect plan. I need to pick up my shoes and start walking. I need to just get somebody behind me who just goes, run! <laughs> I don't need to wait for perfection. I'm gonna do something right now. I choose to get fit, I choose to walk, I choose to run, I choose to go join a club. I'm doing it now. A breakthrough happens the moment you make a new choice. And you don't have to wait. You can just get yourself in a new state. Maybe this tape will get you doing it. Or just have to have a new thought that says, you know what? I made choices in the past. I'm overweight because I chose to eat this and this. I'm not going to eat it anymore. I'm changing now. You can change your whole life real fast with just a few choices. But if you don't make the right choices, eventually you're going to face a crisis. Crisis is when you made so many poor choices that sooner or later life shows up and instead of asking gently for you to change and improve, to grow, to make progress, to be happy, life, when it's a crisis, now demands change. It isn't asking anymore. We borrowed money as a society and we overspent and we talked about changing and we knew we had to change and now a crisis happens and guess what? Nobody has a choice. The game has changed. And what crisis does is it melts us down. It melts us down so that we can recast our life. We can remold ourselves. And usually on the other side, our life is greater because as we go through that crisis, we have to grow. Nobody, everybody wants change, nobody wants to do it. Everybody, I should say, wants progress, but nobody wants to change. Everybody wants their life better, but nobody wants to do the push-ups, the running, have the economic or emotional discipline to make it happen. But if you're watching this right now and you're still with me, some part of you wants more. And I'm saying to you, choose it. And the way you're going to choose it is really simple. If you're in that crisis, what keeps you in the crisis is probably because you're being reinforced. Most people, they overeat or they smoke or they drink or they yell at people. They keep doing it because they're rewarded. Whatever gets rewarded gets reinforced. Whatever habit or behavior is reinforced becomes a habit and then pretty soon 
do it long enough, it becomes part of your personality, and pretty soon you think it's who you are, and you just keep living that way. I mean, it's easy to see this in other people, right? It's easy to see how messed up they are and how easy they could if they just make some new choices. All you gotta do is turn on the television, some news program, some entertainment program, and you'll hear detailed descriptions about some person who is very powerful celebrity who is doing some stupid thing. Why do we see all this stuff on television? Why do we hear about every person you can imagine from Lindsay Lohan to Britney Spears to all the way back to the old days it was Elvis or Michael Jackson or whoever it is that's in the news today in this stage of life in your country as you're watching this. It's because we want to see other people who make bad decisions so we can feel better about our own. But the reason those people don't change, Lindsay Lohan. She's got other DUIs. She's putting herself at risk. She's putting other people where she could kill someone. She goes to jail, it's supposed to be 90 days. But here's the consequence. It goes to two weeks. And before she even gets out of the jail, she makes a deal for an interview and gets paid a million dollars when she gets out for the interview. What do you think the chances of her changing when her bad behavior gets her a million dollars? And I don't know if she even makes that for that much time of acting at this stage. What do you think the chances are when people around her say it's not your fault, it's not fair, they treat you unfairly? As long as we have the decision that we're not responsible, it's not our fault, we can't change anything. We have no power. So, I don't know if by the time you watch this, if Lindsay will change, but if she did, it'll be because the enablers are gone, she's taken responsibility, and she's found something she values more than attention and money for bad behavior. Now, it's easy to look at that with her, but what about you and I? Where are you and I addicted to our problems? Where are you and I reinforced? So many people want to have a big problem. Listen, if things are going well, you say, oh, it's going so great. Your friends go, well, that's great. And after a while, they go, well, easy for you. But if you got a problem, people go, hey, I understand, and they connect with you. Where do we get addicted to our problems? If you want to make a new choice, if you want to make a new decision today, if you want to have a breakthrough in some area of your life, you got to give up the story that it's not your fault and you got to give up the attention and the love and the connection and the commiserating that comes with it with other human beings. Here's how you change. Five simple, quick steps and then I'm going to give you a little tool that if you want to, you can go online and really make a change with. If you're going to change your life, step one, I don't care if something has happened to you. You know, somebody has spilled oil all over where you fish. It's horrific. It's disgusting how they've dealt with it, but it's happened and you got to deal with it. Um, something's happened. Someone in your family's been injured. You've lost your job. I don't care what the problem is. If you're in a crisis, step number one, see it as it is, but don't see it worse than it is. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean be some Mr. or Miss Positive Thinking. By now, if you spend any time with me, you know I'm not about that. I'm not here to tell you, go to that garden and chant, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. Doing affirmations is not gonna change your life. You gotta go see where the weeds are and pull them out. My point is simple. You have gotta see what the problem is, but you can't make it so horrific that you just give up. Today, this is the first generation in almost 100 years of Americans who now believe, the majority of Americans now believe that the quality of life for themselves and their kids in the future is going to be worse than the past. They have, in other words, nothing to look forward to. 63% of the U.S. as of today. Wow. When you start thinking there is no future, you go into what we call learned helplessness, a place where you just kind of give up. And if you get to that place of giving up, then, then you have no power over your life. That's when people get depressed. That's when people do crazy, stupid things. That's when people want to turn to drugs or alcohol or sometimes suicide or just total frustration and anger and their life starts to do the opposite of the breakthrough. It becomes completely stuck and in pain or in ongoing suffering. If you and I are gonna break out of that, we gotta see it as it is. We're not here to be positive thinking people. You gotta see what's really going on. But if you're overweight, you can't say to yourself, well, I'm big boned. That's not why you're overweight. You're overweight because you don't work out, you eat certain things, you eat Cheetos all day long watching TV. I don't know what it is you do, but I know it's not just because you're big boned. You don't want to make it so it's outside your control or you can't change it. So see it as it is, but don't see it worse than it is so that you have no reason to try. Does that make sense? That's the first step. Step two, get to the real truth and deal with it. Don't just see it as it is and not worse than it is. Don't just like balance it, but now get to the truth. I mean, listen, if the truth is you've been trying to get a job for two years and you truly have worked every day in a particular industry, and the number of jobs in that industry have shrunk down, 
and you really aren't getting that job, then you may have to look at the truth. The truth is you might have to retool. You might have to say, gosh, you know, the industry I'm in is gone. I mean, gross simply simplistic example, but for years, vinyl records were around for 85 years. It was a gigantic industry. And things came and went. During the vinyl record time, what happened? Well, there was, remember those eight track tapes? Are you ancient enough to remember those things? Maybe you know somebody remembers those things. These big boxes, you push them in and out. Yeah, eight tracks came and went, vinyl records were still here. And then cassette tapes came, right? And cassette tapes were smaller and more compact and more convenient and more seemingly indestructible. And they came over here and vinyl records were still selling like crazy. If you had a job in vinyl records, you kept it. But then a little thing came along called the CD. And when that happened, almost overnight, you saw an entire industry that had been around almost a century was gone. If you were the guy that worked in the vinyl record factory and knew everything about it, it was the second generation, didn't matter. It was over. And when, now we laugh about a CD, right? Because everything in this digital world, you can have instantly. Who wants to put on a CD? Pretty rare, still available. In vinyl records, maybe there's a small market of people that are collectors, but it's gone. My point is, if you're in the vinyl record business, you've got to tell yourself the truth. You gotta see it as it is, not worse than it is, but you also gotta get the truth and deal with it. You gotta deal with the cards you're dealt. You're gonna have to retool, you're gonna have to change something. You might have to move. If you live in the Gulf, and I don't support anything that's happened there, who could? It's unconscionable what's happened with BP. But if you live in the Gulf and you're a third generation fisherman, and you're now, you've fished for oysters, and they're dead, you better get to the truth. Are they gonna be dead for two years, or 10 or 20, to the best of your ability? And you might say, well, I can't do anything else. I can't. I'm a third generation. This is all I know. Yes, you can. Get to the truth and deal with it. Deal with the card you're dealt with. You got to deal with it, sure, I'm sure, legally. But in the meantime, you got to take care of your family. I'm not saying this off the cuff easy because I've been in those situations where it's impossible, it's unjust, it's wrong, but I still got to deal with it just like you. Am I making sense? It's like, you might say, I, I have lived here my life. You might have to move. You might have to fish someplace else, you might have to, I know you still got to deal with all the consequences, but you got to take back control of your life. There are unjust things that happen, but you got to take control. Easy for me to say, I'm not sitting in your shoes, I get that. But who hasn't experienced some form of injustice, someplace? Who's not dealt with something unfair? Who's not dealt with something that wasn't meant to be unfair, but it affected your entire life, your career, your finances, whatever? You got to tell yourself the truth and you got to get to those dealing with the reality right now. The longer you wait, the longer the crisis will be. If you're having an economic crisis, got to deal with it. Got to downsize, right size, do whatever it takes. And I say, okay, Tony, well, so far you're telling me, don't allow myself to make it so bad I don't try, see it as is, but don't make it worse than it is. And you're telling me, get to the truth and deal with it. Well, that's nice, but you know, how do I do that? Maybe the third step, more than just getting the, the role model, maybe to be more specific is get a vision first. Get a vision and get strong. That's what I think your third step should be. Your first, tell yourself the truth, yes. See it as it is, not worse than it is. Tell yourself the truth and deal with it. But the way to deal with it is say, what am I gonna go for? There's gotta be a compelling future. I gotta come up with a vision for my life. Or a vision for my relationship. I've had terrible relationships, nothing's worked. Tell yourself the truth. I've made poor choices or I told myself stories and gave myself excuses or I've not had the courage, whatever it is, get to the truth and then get yourself a vision for what you do want. Because you have to have something you're gonna to move towards. Does that make sense? It, without a vision, people perish. It says in a very good book, called The Good Book. I know there are many good books, but that's a good one to take a look at. We need something to go for. We can deal with any problem today as long as there's something that we can look for in the future that we can strive for. It'll give us the emotional and psychological fuel, the juice, to keep moving forward. So you gotta come up with a vision, and a way to do that, we'll call that step four. Get a role model. Um, you might get the vision from a role model, you might get the vision just from coming up with a new idea. But in order to figure out how to go from where you are to where you wanna be, to close the gap from where you are to where you wanna be, it's best to learn by other people's experience whenever you can. So get a role model, get their strategy, and go to work. Get into action. So I'll give you an example. Um, 
Years ago, when I was first starting to try to figure out how to build myself financially, I grew up at a time when just as I was starting to do well, this big recession happened. And I remember I was like 29, 30 years old, I think, and maybe 31, and I was doing okay. And then all of a sudden, there were all these business challenges because we went through this severe recession back in those days. And I remember at the time, everybody was downsizing and freaking out, and I thought, you know what? I don't want to just settle for this. I want to find a way to do well. Who's done well in really tough times? And so I started doing my homework. And in those days, you know, you didn't go out and use the internet the way you do today. You couldn't access all that information. We actually went to libraries and did research in traditional ways. I'm ancient enough to remember those days. And um, I started hearing about this man named Sir John Templeton. Very famous man. He's a man who became a multi-billionaire as an investor. He started with nothing. But what was interesting is when I started to find out about his story, because here's a guy that when he's a young man, he's called Sir John Templeton now, he was actually an American originally, and he wasn't Sir, he came from a very poor family, and he just decided that in his life, he wanted to not only do well financially, he wanted to do so well he could help other people at any level that he wanted. And today, by the way, he's passed, but before he did, he created the Templeton Fund, and he also created a fund that now delivers money, gives money each year at the Templeton Prize to people that do good spiritual works and it's larger than the Nobel Prize and it continues to go on. The guy started with nothing and here's how he did it. Listen to me now. The reason I look for him as a role model is because he made all his money in the worst of times. He made all his money when people were going through the equivalent of the deepest recession or depression possible. His whole belief was, and this is different than almost anybody else you see around you, was pessimism was the secret to success. <laughs> that what he wanted to do was make money when people are most pessimistic. Because when people are optimistic, they want you to pay for their house a huge sum of money. But as they start getting more and more pessimistic, where pretty soon they think they can never, the house is the worst thing to have, they'll virtually give you the house. They'll virtually give you the business. And so he made all his money starting in World War II. When the war broke out, when Hitler invaded over in Europe, he took all the money he had and borrowed total money of $10,000, a total amount. He bought with $10,000 every stock on the New York Stock Exchange that was $1 or less that he thought might be useful, including some companies that look like they're going to be bankrupt. But he did it when people were the most pessimistic. Because if you recall, it looked like Hitler was going to take over. It didn't look like we were all going to be the winners. It looked like Hitler was going to dominate. And when people were that scared, they would give up anything they had just to get a little bit back. And so he bought all the stock that eventually made him a multi-billionaire. He became a billionaire because after things changed, after the war, just five years later, and the economy started to surge, everything changed for him. Where do you think he invested next after World War II? Where was a country that was pummeled, that was down, the factories were basically turned into mud? Japan. You could buy things for pennies in Japan that would have cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars before, and he did. When everyone was most pessimistic, he went and did well. And then he sold when the 80s surged and when everybody thought Japan was the greatest country on earth and had the biggest businesses he sold and made his maximum profit when people were overly optimistic. He did the same thing down in South America when inflation went crazy. This man spent his entire life basically having a strategy of how to succeed when everybody else was scared. I tell you that because he's a role model. What he did, how he did it, it's all in writing, it's crystal clear. He could do the same. But you won't be able to do it when you're telling yourself the sky is falling and it's over. When you see it worse than it is, you'll just give up. You won't do it if you don't tell yourself the truth is, you know what, this system isn't working. I gotta do something. I gotta change my finances. I gotta change my job. I gotta reach. If you don't tell yourself the truth and deal with the truth, the real truth, nothing's gonna happen. You won't ever even think about a guy like John Templeton if you don't have a vision that says, I don't care how the environment is, I'm gonna find a way to do well. And you won't do well unless you get a strategy based on a role model who's really done it. My whole thing is this, if anybody has something you want, they aren't lucky. They did something. If you model them, if you take similar steps, you can produce a similar result. Make sense? And finally, the fifth step, look, if you're in a situation where you see it as is, but not worse than it is, if you've told yourself the truth and you dealt the cards you're dealt with and just decided you're gonna change it, and you're willing to do what's necessary. If you put yourself in a place where you got a new vision and you got yourself strong, if you got a role model and you got some strategy and you got yourself into action, step five is give much more than you expect to receive. Simple as that sounds, if you find a way to meet people's needs in business, 
in an intimate relationship, meeting your kids' needs, anybody's needs, the whole game changes. Truth is, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. You know, the truth will, it doesn't feel good, but not feeling good is sometimes is where you get your drive to change things. Deal with what is, without exaggeration, with total honesty, dealing with the cards, coming up with a vision, finding yourself a role model that shows your strategy, work your tail off, give, 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 keep changing your approach, and you can get where you want to go. Make sense? Now that might sound like a lot. So to get you started, here's what I like you to do for this session. Start out if you want by taking a big crisis or problem you have and going through these steps. Say, okay, what's really true? And let me exaggerate, let me stop the exaggeration. Let me not make it worse than it is. Just let's define what's true. Let's stop the story. Just here's what it is. We got this much financial challenge. We got this physical challenge, whatever it is. And then go to step two. All right, let's find out the truth. Let's get the details. Let's get the details and figure out what we're gonna do. And then, Here's where we're going to go. This is where we're going to eventually get to. It might take us longer to get where we want to go, but we're going to get here. Who's done it that we can model, that we can follow the steps in, who can coach us? And let's just work our tail off and change every day. But to give you a quick jump, sometimes when you're in the middle of crisis or a crisis, multiple crises, lots of things going on simultaneously, it feels a bit overwhelming. So, and you might not know role models. And I say, Tony, I don't know who. Well, not hard on the internet these days to find role models or come to an event. You know, I can promise you we can show you plenty of role models. This is what I do for a living. But what you can do right away is you can model yourself. Think about it. Almost everyone alive has been through more than one tough, tough time, crisis or multi-crises, where you're having a problem financially and you're having a problem with your family and you're having a health problem all simultaneously. Those are the intense ones, right? But if you're standing still today, most of us have found a way to get through it. And if you don't, you know someone who went through a tough time, a grandmother, an aunt, an uncle, somebody. The greatest way to make that change happen when you break out of a you know, breakthrough, you break out of a problem, you break out of a crisis, is model yourself. What's been one of the toughest times of your life that you did get through? Maybe it was a financial situation, maybe it was a career situation. Again, maybe it was an intimate relationship where you were crushed, you thought you could never make it through all the pain you went through there. You know, maybe it was a physical challenge, a health challenge. Maybe it was a lack of confidence or ability. I don't know what it was, but what was a just incredibly tough time that you did make it through? You go back and you think about that situation. What pulled you through? What pulled you through that situation? What did you, what did you learn? What distinction? Or did you get a strategy? Or was it a belief? Or did you meet someone who helped you? Or was it just somehow you clicked into your faith and you kicked yourself into gear? What pulled you through those tough times? Was it a person? Was it a place? Was it an idea? Was it a distinction? Was it a belief? What was it? What did you do to go from where you were to where you are today? What did you do to get over that situation? What did you do to get through that situation? What did you do to turn it around? What action did you take? Who did you go learn from? What skill did you go get? What, 
what did you physically do? Kind of give us the description of what you did because we all want to know. Because you can provide us a pathway. You may have been through a crisis that someone else is going through right now and they can learn from you because they can learn the shortcut. Because you went through this crisis, whatever the crisis was, how are you stronger or are you more compassionate because you felt that suffering, you don't want anybody else to feel it? Or are you more hopeful because you know you made it through that so you can make it through other things? Or are you in a situation where you've got a skill today that you didn't have and wouldn't have had if it wasn't for that situation that made you have to grow? Or are you just happier today? because you have a contrast of what life could be like, and so now you appreciate the simple moments. How are you better mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, or spiritually today because you went through the crisis? Even though you wouldn't want to go through it again, you don't want anybody else to go through it, how did it actually serve you in the end? Who here has ever failed? Who here has failed miserably at something you wanted to achieve? When you failed, why did you fail? I failed because... Okay, good. I didn't have enough money. What else? Didn't have, didn't have the right technology. Good, sir. Why, why'd you fail? I had the wrong people. They say I had the wrong leader. Isn't that interesting? It was the economy, bad economy. Not enough time, didn't have enough time. Now I asked this question for the first time about seven years ago. I was at this place called TED. Anybody watching those TED videos? And TED didn't have a website or anything at that stage. It was a very small program. It was done for about 800 people in Silicon Valley, most of them billionaire investors, the founders of Yahoo, the founders of Apple, the founders of a whole series of companies. And I was brought in, and they say, you got 18 minutes, which my shortest seminar is four fucking days. So I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And then when, before they introduced me, the guy who was introducing me wasn't the guy who invited me, and he was an English guy. We're good friends today. But back then, he didn't know who I was. He thought I was a motivator. So he got up and he said, first thing he said to me before I went out there goes, oh, nice to meet you. Don't have people do that jumping shit I heard you do. So he wants me to take these dead people and leave them dead in this dark room sitting. And I watched before I got up to speak, and there was a woman who was a genius, and she was te teaching string theory, which is one of the most complex things on earth. And they gave her 18 minutes, and people were shuffling their feet, and at the end, they didn't even clap for her. They were assholes. They all thought their shit didn't stink. These are all the achievers of the world. So I walk out there, and the introduction he gives me is Tony Robbins is like a motivator, and he's helped a lot of sports people, so maybe he can you know, create some energy here. He had a very publicized divorce a few years ago. I couldn't fucking believe it. He really did say that. If you watch the TED video, he cut that out because he's embarrassed. I said, so I got up afterwards and I said, that's a privilege to be here. I said, uh, I didn't know that my divorce was very publicized, but my ex-wife is very happy. <laughs> she has tens of millions of dollars, but I didn't come about that. I came to serve you. And then I was trying to figure out how to engage this room, so I asked them a question I just asked you. I said, who here has ever failed? And no one raised their hand in the whole fucking room. So I paused and I said, I know you're out there. I can hear your hearts beating. Who here has ever failed? And I demanded an answer, and then a few people raised their hand and said, who here has ever failed? And now all, they started complying. So I said, great, when you failed, why did you fail? And they said all the things you said. Didn't have enough time, didn't have the right technology, didn't have the money, didn't have the contacts, you know, had the wrong people. The people said we had the wrong leader. Because let's just do this logically. Everything you people have told me, I didn't have the technology, I didn't have the right contacts, I didn't have the time, I didn't have money. Everything you've told me, I didn't have enough Supreme Court justices, those are resources. 
And so you're telling me I failed because I didn't have the resources. And I'm here to tell you what you already know. Resources are never the problem. It's a lack of resourcefulness is why you failed. Because the ultimate resources are emotional states. If you're creative enough, can you find the answer? Yes or no? If you're determined enough, can you find the breakthrough? Yes or no? If you're passionate, loving enough, can you get someone to help you? Yes or no? If there's no way that you're committed, can you find the money even if you don't have it? Yes or no? So I said creativity, decisiveness, passion, honesty, sincerity, love, these are the ultimate human resources. And when you engage these resources, you can get any other resource on earth. And I said, so you told me all the resources you're missing and you hypnotize yourself into believing that you don't have what you want because you don't have the resources when the most successful people in history had no resources, but they were incredibly resourceful, so they got the resources. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. And if you don't have what you want, stop telling yourself the story because you don't have the money, you don't have the time, that's bullshit. It's because you haven't committed yourself where you would burn your boats. If you want to take the fucking island, burn your fucking boats and you will take the island because people, when they're going to either die or succeed, tend to succeed. But most of us give ourselves a way out and that's why we don't have what we want. So if you and I really want to know what's going to take to get your dream and make it real, it's to stop all the things you told yourself that aren't. And I'm here to tell you what I said at the top of our discussion, 80% of success is psychology and 20% is mechanics. That's true of running your business, that's true of your intimate relationship, that's true of your body, that's true in your level of happiness. So you've got to know the 20% because that gives you the edge, right, those strategies, but you've got to know the psychology. If you're in business right now, there's a few things. The chokehold, since, again, how many own a business? So I'm real clear, really do own a business. You're not thinking about it, you own one. Raise your hand so I can see. Shit, most of you, I'm impressed. So if you own your business, I'll tell you right now, the chokehold on the growth of your business is you. It is not your people. It is the leader of this organization. The leader is the chokehold. And the chokehold comes in one of two forms. Your psychology, you think you've tried everything. You've tried everything, but what fucking works? Who knows what I'm talking about here, right? Or it's a skill that you're missing. Like you really are incredible at writing code, but you don't know shit about accounting and finance, and it's eating your business alive. Because I gotta tell you, 96% of all businesses in a 10 year period of time go under. Only 4% make it. By the way, make it doesn't mean that you succeed and have any money, it just means you're still standing. 4%. And by the way, after 10 years, you're set, right? There's no more challenges. Ever heard of a company called Lehman Brothers? Right? A hundred year old company. If you took their gross revenues and added them up, it'd be a trillion dollars over the decades. A trillion with a T and they're no longer here. That's how competitive the world is today. So if you got into business and you're in it right now, I love you, I respect you as a brother or sister, and I know you're a crazy son of a bitch just like me. You have to be. Who gets in a sport where the longer you play, the more likely you die? You're a gladiator if you're in business. A gladiator goes out there and they know every time I go out, I can die. And the longer I stay in the game, the more likely I die. But every day they go out to win. That takes an incredible psychology. But in that psychology, we bump onto limits and that's what you gotta shift. And if your psychology is solid, then you gotta say, where are the skills I'm missing? Because that's equally important. I created a brand, and that's why I have the privilege to serve you. But that brand came because I realized early in my career, I get the best ideas in the world, but they're gonna die on my lips unless I can market them, unless I can build a brand. 
It is the most important thing today because the world is made up of commodities. The world is so competitive. If you're a commodity, if you're a race for the lowest price, you will be out of business within 10 years, probably more like two to five. You have to have something that separates you from everybody else on earth. And until you find out that something, you will be stressed and you will be struggling. But everybody has it or anybody can create it. That's my expertise. My companies, I started with zero. We do more than five billion with a B per year, my companies. I had a mission, but I realized I have to master business or that mission is gonna die. And you gotta get that too. Because otherwise you're gonna be one of the many who work your ass off and not have what you deserve. So this is an area that deserves mastery, not dabbling. And probably most of you in this room work your ass off in your business and you're still working in the business, you're not working on the business. I know you know the difference. And if you do, you're not getting distinctions that are cutting edge. One right strategy can save you 10 years, but you've got to go get it. You can't just keep doing what you're doing and then pumping yourself back up. So you've got to get the skills. Marketing is one of those skills. Selecting the right people is everything. So knowing how to pick the right people, knowing how to train those people, knowing what you're going to do in sales, knowing what you're going to do in marketing, knowing what you're going to do in the financial side of your business is everything. You have to master these things. You can't hope and expect your business to be there. A breakthrough is when there's something you struggle with for a long time, you say you're gonna change, you say you're gonna make it happen, you're gonna lose that weight, you're gonna grow your revenues, you're gonna make that profit, you're gonna make something happen, you're gonna find that relationship, you're gonna stop smoking and you start, you get right near the edge. And then you pull back. Who's done this multiple times before, but then finally had a breakthrough, you broke through and actually changed it, say I. So jot down what a breakthrough is and let me give you the three steps of it. A breakthrough is a moment in time. That's what it is. It's a moment in time. It's a moment where suddenly what was impossible becomes possible. For that to happen, for the impossible to become possible, and for you to have action that's going to get results, really, I found over the years, any kind of breakthrough that you're going to have requires three things to it. And if you never see me again, and you're ever in a place where you say, I'm sick of fighting this, I'm sick of not getting results I want, I don't want to just learn more, I want to break through. If you remember this and go back to the simple formula, and by the way, I've made this simple purposely. You know why? Complexity is the enemy of execution. The more complex you make it, the less likely you're going to execute. I'm so good at getting people to do things because I make it so damn simple, you can't miss it. So let's do it. What's it going to take to have a breakthrough? Before I tell you, let's have you think of an area where you once fought and you finally had a breakthrough. For you personally, what's an area where you pushed and pushed and pushed, you couldn't do it, couldn't do it, and you finally made yourself do it and broke through? A man once said, you tell a lie big enough, loud enough, and long enough, sooner or later people will believe you. Who said that? Hitler. And most of us are Hitler in our own minds. We convince ourselves of challenges. So when a person says, well, you know, these, I've tried, someone who hasn't lost weight, they'll say, I've tried, come on, what do they say? I've tried everything, bullshit. If you tried everything, you'd be fit and strong. Well, I've tried thousands of ways. Thousands? Name them. Well, I've tried hundreds, name them. Well, I've tried dozens, name them. Well, I did do these two stupid things that don't work over and over again. Mine was, I'm big boned. I am big boned, but I was 38 pounds heavier with the same bones. So we often say things that are true to back things up. They are true, you're big boned, but that is not why you're fat, right? So the story keeps us from it. If you don't have the relationship you want, what's the story? All the good ones are gone and they're gay and I'm not or they're not gay and I am. This is a story. The story is there. In fact, write this down. The only thing keeping you from getting what you want, the only thing keeping you from getting what you want is the story you keep telling yourself about why you don't have it. 
The only thing keeping you from getting what you really want is the story you keep telling yourself about why you don't have it yet. Here's what I say. Divorce your story and marry the truth. Divorce your story and marry the truth. And don't make it one of those divorces where you revisit with your old past belief system again. Divorce it, cut it off, and marry the truth. The truth will set you what? But you got to develop the empowering story because without that. Now, some of you think an empowering story is the one that allows you to be, keep going at what doesn't work. I'm not talking about a story where you cover your ass and explain that you're still going to achieve what you want someday in the future because no one can argue with that because the future's not here, but really you're not doing anything to change significant. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say I. So you've got to find a story that's going to empower you to act, a story that's going to get you to find the breakthrough because otherwise, with a lousy story, you'll never find the strategy or you'll come up with a reason why it's too expensive, you can't get there, you can't access it, or you'll even get the strategy and then half-ass apply it just so you can reward your story that says it doesn't work because I tried it. If you want to know the difference in people's lives, it all comes down to what are the things that are the must for you versus shoulds. So let me tell you this. We said to have an extraordinary life, you got to have an extraordinary psychology, right? Extraordinary psychology means you got to live in an extraordinary state. To be in an extraordinary state, you got to condition your nervous system, your body, your physiology and focus to be at their best. Do you agree with this? Yes or no? Then to do that, though, you can do that. Why doesn't everybody? Not because you can't. We all have the ability. It's because of our standards. I remember a time early in my career, I was about 24, and I went to do a seminar in Boston. And in those days, a big seminar for me was like 125 people. It was a three-day seminar, and we worked around the clock, and people made such extraordinary changes in their life. And at the end of it, I was feeling so fulfilled. I was thinking, my God, I'm 24, maybe 25 at the time. And I am so happy, because I, I have found my mission in life. I'm doing what I love. It's making a difference in people's lives. This is extraordinary. So we finished about midnight on the Sunday night. And around midnight, you know, I'm still wound up, so I don't feel like going to bed. So I decided, okay, you know, let me take a walk here, and I decided to go through Copley Square. If you've been through Copley Square, you know, it's a pretty neat place. Because in Copley Square, you can look up and you can see buildings that were here before we were known as the United States, and beside them you see skyscrapers that are new. It's a pretty cool place. So I'm walking around midnight on Sunday night. There's nobody in Copley Square midnight on Sunday night. And I'm walking along, and I see this guy in the distance, and he's kind of stumbling back and forth between the gutter and the sidewalk. He has a long trench coat on, his head's down like this. He's holding the brown bag, and I can start to smell him even before I get there. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy is obviously drunk. And as I started to get closer, I thought, I bet he's going to beg me for some money. And sure enough, whatever you focus on life tends to happen, doesn't it? So sure enough, he gets real close to me, and I thought all of a sudden he wasn't going to do it. All of a sudden he popped his head up. It was really weird. He went, Mister! He had this really bizarre looking sounding voice. He went, Mister! Could you loan me quarter? And I thought, do I want to reward this behavior? And then I thought, I don't want him to suffer. Do you have this dilemma sometimes? Like, you know, I'm not here to judge. So years ago, I finally decided I always just give. Even the person's pulling a scam, that's for them to deal with. If I have the ability, then I give. And so I thought, but could I teach him something? So I asked him a question back. I said, is that all you want is a quarter? So he goes, yeah, just one quarter. One quarter changed my whole life. One quarter. I said, really? He said, yeah, one quarter. So I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out my money clip. And in those days, I was you know, very young, just starting to succeed. And my original mentor was a man named Jim Rohn. I don't know. How many have heard of Jim Rohn? Anybody? Yeah, he's a great guy. And Jim told me, he said, Tony, look, you've come from a poor background. You've got a poor psychology. You've got to change it. He said, you don't have any money, so pretend you do. He said, start training your brain. Condition it. He said, go save all your money, get $300 bills, and put them on the outside of your money clip, even though you only have five bucks in between them. So every time you put it out, you'll see that, you'll feel inspired, you'll feel better. He said, and you'll feel better, you'll do better. So I was like, okay. So I did. So I pulled my money clip, and sure enough, I got $300 bills in. I made sure he saw the bills. So I'm tearing through that, right? Looking in between there, see if I can find some change. But I made sure he saw it. Sure enough, he's looking at the $100 bills, checking it out. I find the quarter, I pull it out, take the money, put it in my pocket. I notice he's watching my hand going into the pocket. I took the quarter, and I looked at him, and I said, Sir life will pay any price you ask of it. I gave him the quarter. And then something really interesting happened. He took the quarter. He 
you looked at the quarter, you looked at me, you looked at my pocket, you looked back at the quarter, looked at me, you looked at my pocket, looked at me again, looked at the quarter, looked at my pocket, looked back at me and said, you're weird. And then he shuffled on off like this, right? And I thought to myself, wow, what's the difference between him and me? I mean, I was 24, 25 at the time, doing what I love most, have my mission in life. And he's in his early 60s, drunk on the street, begging for quarters. What's the difference? And I thought, well, maybe God's blessed me because I'm such a good person. I thought, oh, that's, and he's such a bad person, that's such a bull. And I thought, wow, maybe the answer to that question is what I just told him. Life will pay whatever price you ask of it. But you know what's interesting? You gotta ask intelligently. In the Bible it says, ask and you shall what? Pretty good formula, you gotta look into it. But you know what? It says, ask and you shall receive, but I'm sure it meant ask intelligently. I'm sure that's what God meant. I'm sure he didn't mean bitch and you will receive wine and you will receive. I don't think that was the instruction. Now, if you're going to ask intelligently, there might be five elements of that. Number one, you'd have to ask specifically, wouldn't you? You wouldn't ask in a general way. People do all the time. They go, I want more money. Fine. Here's a dollar. Get out of here. Very often, you're getting what you're asking for. You're just not aware of how general you're asking. Clarity is power. The more clear you are about exactly what it is you want, the more your brain knows how to get there. Your brain is a servo mechanism. It's like a bomb. Those bombs, those missiles, they have a servo mechanism. So if the target moves, it knows what the target is, it follows it. Your brain, when you condition it, knows exactly what to go for and it'll find a way to get there.